Well, hello, everybody. Uh, here we are with Aristo, and uh, we're actually recording on the, uh, uh, it's the 18th, but this will be the video for the 20th, since, since I've already recorded one for the 19th. So, Aristo, uh, you've already said that uh, you're going to be uh, talking about may we live in interesting times, and my comment was we already do. <laughs> so, take it away, and uh, we'll see where we go. Okay, Ron, let's see, let's see. Maybe we're going to get controversial this time, or maybe not. Um, I was basically looking at all kinds of news and other things today, and uh, I managed to, I don't know, the atmosphere is really weird, and you can tell. You can tell by all of the things that are going on, a compact, the bad news, killings in the Western world, racial tension, economic tension, uh, people screaming that World War III is coming, uh, and that's just in the secular domain. If you're somebody who's psychically sensitive, you're probably sensing a whole spectrum of other energies that are mostly disturbing. Uh, and, however, a lot of people in alternative spirituality, to use the term spirituality, um, would easily say that, oh, this is part of the transformation. What we do know, though, is that we do live in interesting times. And this is a well-known uh, Chinese curse. Um, I've heard it a lot on the Internet, so it's not like something that most people have probably heard, uh, heard it as well. Now that you mention it. <laughs> yes. Uh, and like you said, we have no choice. It's unavoidable. And I say um, it should be unavoidable. May we live in interesting times. It's about time we lived in interesting times because uh, existence on this planet cannot go business as usual. Many people on this planet have been living in interesting times, uh, whether they liked it or not, and not in a good way. Um, many people have been suffering famines, wars, and while the Western world has been living high on the hog that is not a good thing. Um, many people in a minority group all over the world are living high on the hog now, and most, the 99%, uh, are more or less suffering. Um, there's an intended culling of the population going on. It's already begun. The food is poisoned, the water is poisoned, you know, vaccines, chemtrails. They call it geoengineering, but it's really... Um, bioengineering. It's really life existential engineering. It's, it's the engineering of humanity, of humanity's demise uh, by folks that think they have things covered. In reality, however, nobody is outside of the system. That's an illusion. Um, you often bring up God and, and all of that. Even God at this point is not, or at any point, is not outside of the system of transformation. I firmly believe divinity is an evolving dynamic. I don't believe in static divinity. It doesn't make sense to me. So you don't I believe don't. in omniscience then? I do, but I don't believe omniscience is a static thing. I believe it is an open-ended dynamic. You might call it a paradox. There may be a static divinity that's perfect, but such perfection cannot interact with manifestation. It can impel manifestation like an attractor toward it. Uh, for example, if you've ever seen the mathematical concept of asymptote, basically that means that if you have a line like this and you have a curve, the curve goes down, down, comes closer and closer, and, and off into infinity, but it never touches the line. It just infinitely gets closer and closer and closer. It's like us, we can evolve, toward perfection more and more and more toward this ideal, but we never quite touch the ideal. We're just constantly moving toward it. Uh, it's almost like the ideal is receding because as soon as you hit a point of, oh, there's the horizon. You hit the horizon, the horizon's over there. Perfection doesn't exist. It's an illusion. We, we use a word and we call it perfection, omniscient. That's not perfection. That's I mean, If you're psychic, you can, you can become very... Uh, your, your sentience, uh, your radius of perception increases. That's relative. So somebody who has like a, a million-fold um, knowledge of 
compared to you seems omniscient. We can't even conceive, conceive what true omniscience is. But one thing it isn't is static because everything changes. So you have to take change into account. So you yourself have to constantly be changing. If you're outside of anything, if you're infinite, then everything else has to be finite and thus bounded. Maybe that is the case. But the point is, whether it's bounded or not, it is also growing. So that's what living systems do and are. I, I started out talking about we live in interesting times, and people think in a secular manner. I know you are not really a secular person exclusively. However, I have noticed you too uh, think in the secular manner, and your approaches to spirituality are, are secular. God is like a person. God is a parent. You know, these metaphors are very real for you. Uh, if God is perfect, perfection means uh, something that I like, that, that, that can serve me, but is, is, it doesn't matter if I can't conceive of it. I can conceive of the word. And I use the word perfection. And this word guides me what God can't be, what the divinity cannot be, uh, what is the concept. And, and then others come in with more esoteric-oriented concepts like we are God, or God is within us, or, you know, everything is God. You know, the thing is that if you're truly talking about something that is absolute, then it's encompassing everything. It's everything. Now, what levels are you speaking of? Are you speaking of the creator? Well, the creator is one thing. If you're the creator, then there's something that's not the creator. But if, if you're talking about God, God is both the creator and all the not the creator stuff. It's everything. God is what is and what is not. So you are talking about uh, the creator, but not the absolute. Uh, you cannot personalize the absolute. Personalizing means in the image and likeness of you, but you're a finite being. So even if you look at anything in the mirror, if it's finite, the reflection is going to be finite. The image and the likeness is going to be finite. It may be far beyond. It may be living. Maybe the thing in the mirror is not a living being, you know, but it still has a shape and a form. So even if my spirit or the spirit that I am is in the image and likeness, uh, it is still in some way manifest. It is finite. It, it, it may be infinite, but that infinity at this point, it doesn't register for me. So there is a gap between what you would call absolute spirit that is in the image and likeness of the absolute and the finite spirit that I identify as my consciousness. These concepts get entangled, as you can see. I mean, I'm, I'm just talking off the top of my head right now. But these ideas get entangled. And you can over-intellectualize them. The reason that I consider myself a spiritual or esoteric type person is because it involves practices. What consciousness is, for example, is something experienced. Um, what uh, energy is, what psychic abilities are, to some extent, they are experiences. So through those experiences, then you tackle the notions of divinity, the notions of creator, the notions of what spirit is, of what will is, of what desire is, uh, a magnetic emotional energy. These things are actual experiences and they're very tangible. And so in a certain way, um, they may be beyond the five senses. Maybe there's a sixth sense involved or a seventh sense. You can say the seventh sense might be consciousness itself. Perhaps consciousness is not the be all and end all, but it's actually a contacting dynamic. I mean, it may be perception, a form of perception, the seventh sense, if the sixth sense is feeling. Uh, I amness or consciousness is a form of contact. See, in a sense, since we hit barriers of understanding, we are finite. We're not omniscient. So sometimes we treat this divinity concept as something that we expect to be omniscient, that we expect to be infinite, but we talk about it as if it's finite. I mean, our responses to it are responses to a finite dynamic. We seek to understand it on our terms. We seek it a personal relationship, which is you, you have a personal relationship with something that's finite. How, you, how can you relate to the infinite? It's inconceivable. All you can think of is more of the same, infinite repetition. Um, at the same time, 
finite does not mean hobbled or crippled. It doesn't mean less than. You know, these are human concepts that we use in our life as we live it with our five senses. Uh, maybe even with the sixth or the seventh sense because uh, reality is open-ended, in my opinion, because we can conceive of it as open-ended. There is no absolute limit that says you cannot go beyond this. If there is, it doesn't matter because to us, you know, it, it may be like, like Einstein was saying, the universe is, is such that if you go um, in any direction, at the speed of light, for example, for any amount of time, you're going to end up coming back where you started. It's like a big sphere, like the surface of a sphere. That's the universe is curved. That's what physics, the relativity theory says, basically, that it's curved. So you can just run in any direction, go straight. You're going to end up right back where you started. So in a way, it's infinite because you can go as many times as you want all over the place. But you're always going to, you're never going to go outside of that surface. You need another dimension to hop away from that. Uh, but at the same time, it doesn't conceive of that. Again, all of these are conceptions. They're in the mind and of the mind. Uh, and you say, well, what does that do for me? You know, what does that help? My questions, my this and that. Your questions, in my honest opinion, are emotional. And that's good. That's where it comes down to. That's where meaning is because emotion is experience. Intellectual concepts they're almost like projections. They're like maps you see on the wall. They're not the territories. Things like actual experience are the territories. The experience of life, the experience of relationship, the experience of other people, of emotions. Even thoughts are only experience when they give us emotions. If you have a response to the thought, oh, that's a great idea. Or wow, that, that idea leads me to do something, you know. If the idea has no emotional content, I mean, if it doesn't create any response in you whatsoever that's tangible, yeah, and if you can't do anything with it, then what is it? It's just a projection, a map of an idea, of a reality. It's not, it's real, but it's not an experience. It's an at a distance projection, a shadow of an experience. And yet this is the world that is imposed on us. This is the interesting world we live in, a world that is trying to push our buttons. And, and I say world because there are forces within that world that are doing this. But in the end, the buttons that are being pushed are still ours. They're who we are, you know. So I'm essentially saying we live in interesting times, but we have never had control and mastery of ourselves. We've always been manipulated. And our fathers have been manipulated, our mothers, our grandmothers, our grandfathers, and our ancestors, and everybody has been or manipulated. As far back as we know. As far back as we know. And let's say we evolved from an animal-like being, whatever. That has also been manipulated by the environment, let's say, even if you don't act divinity. Um, and a lot of people talk about things like, okay, we've been engineered by extraterrestrials, or we've been created by these Elohim characters or whatever you know the point is and we say oh we have so that's a big thing my contention is why is it a big thing it happened it's over we don't owe these creators anything you know that's the whole point these people are coming to us telling us through these myths that we owe them because they created us it's it's not like that you know, because you can consider it differently. Even if that story is true, and I think it's a distortion personally, even if it is true, what goes on is that we are being blackmailed, coerced, bombarded with these mythologies that are not even real as far as we know. And then other ones that, that lend us to a religion. We owe these creators. We owe this creator. You know, you had a video, again, and that prompted part of this conversation. God is a jealous God, you know. Mm -hmm. And somebody said, no, it means, and it is. In Greek, it's zealot. God is a, a God that is a, a zealot. But the context in the Hebrew word, again, is jealousy. It's envy. It basically says that I don't want you going to anybody because I am the, the creator. I made you. I own you. You can't pay attention to anything or anybody but me. 
because I made you because, you know, again, we have human attributes being projected. And often, um, perhaps these attributes were projected because why? Well, uh, you want to give people divinity. People don't understand divinity. What, what the hell is this God thing? Well, it's the guy that created you. Well, why should I care? Because he's going to zap you. He's going to hurt you. That's the whole thing the Bible is. If you take punishment and reward out of the Bible, what are you left with? Mm -hmm. Really? Take, and, and essentially, reward and punishment, that's childish. You do that to slaves and children. You know. That's my point in some of my videos. Exactly. So take out, and people will freak out. Oh, without that, you know, oh, so we're just, just circus animals or, or whatever, you know. Why is there reward and punishment? Why would something create us with free? First of all, it's almost like this. Do you have free will if somebody punishes you every time you use it? You know, and they don't like what you, what you decide? I mean, is that really free will? I mean, the, the, the establishment is doing that. And it's, oh, yes, this is a democracy. But as soon as you do something they don't like, they screw you. They throw you in jail. They punish you. It doesn't matter if it obeys the golden rule or not or if it hurts anybody. You know, you go smoke a joint, you're screwed. You go and you, you eat raw milk in, in certain places, you're screwed. You know, here in Greece, I just learned that if, if somebody dares, you know, and they used to do that all the time. You have goats, you have sheep, you have cows, you know, and they're clean. And then somebody milks them and says, here, have some nutritious raw milk from a goat. And this is, you know, you could live on this stuff. I could have a piece of land with, with, with 10 chickens and a goat and a few vegetables, and that's it. I'm done. You know, I can live. And so, and if you drink this stuff, it has everything you need. You don't have to eat meat even. If, even if you're a meat eater, this stuff, milk, you know, which doesn't make anything suffer when you take it away. All you have to do basically is, well, the, the, the female goat has to, have, uh, has to get pregnant. And, and, and at least once. And then, you know, it keeps it going that way. But the point is, if you don't want to eat meat, there's such a thing as eggs, there's such a thing as butter, there's such a thing as, you know, dairy products. Um, and then you have other organisms that are basically so low on the food chain, fermented products, uh, stuff like that, fungi that are between a plant and an animal, you know. But what I'm saying is that if you exercise your right to live in a healthy way so your mind actually clears and you can fight against all of this manipulation, the establishment comes after you because they don't want you to do that. So is it a coincidence that these religions happen to, to promote the same attitude? If you go against this divinity, you get punished, but you're exercising your free will because then you say, well, why wasn't I just programmed to be obedient? That would save me a hell of a lot of punishment, you know. And that's what you've said often, because it's free will. Well, the point of free will is to be able to make decisions that you can learn from. Punishment is not learning, you know. And I'm not talking about somebody who goes and kills somebody else and stuff like that. Now, there are consequences. If we are interconnected, if the nature of existence is such, I'm free, okay. I have free will, desire. But the nature of existence is there's such a thing as gravity. So I jump off a cliff, I'm going to fall. That's a consequence of the nature of existence, of, of manifestation, of the laws of physics, so to speak, that are there to keep everything in place so we have form, so we have distinction, so we have multiplicity, and everything else, beauty. You know, this thing comes from the so-called laws of physics, which aren't laws. They're not, nobody made them rules. I mean, these are laws the, in a court of law, in a, in, a, in a constitutional agreement of what? No, they are the nature of things. Existence has moves in this direction because the interaction of its forces, of its movements, that's how it expresses. If I, if I sit and breathe and feel joy when somebody loves me, that's not a law. You know, that's my nature. So we're taught to look at things in terms of legality and illegality. I mean, and that's one of the buttons that is being pushed. So again, I cover a, a somewhat broad spectrum in these interesting times 
and 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 you look at these things and you say how can i even consider all of these things i can't spend my time thinking about all this crap i got to go make a buck i'm thinking about my children i'm thinking about this or that well we live in interesting times and that means you cannot keep your life to a lowest common denominator like you had once said we cannot be happy unless everybody is happy you cannot be healed unless everybody is healed this is not communism this is the web of life and you cannot sacrifice the individual for the collective you cannot sacrifice the collective for the individual either a balance must be found Balance. And a balance is there, and we are equipped. The very fact that you have this dire desire to find a balance, to, to that you value it, that you intuit it, that it probably makes sense to all of the people or most of the people watching this, means that we have the capacity to engage this way. That balance is innate in us. The capacity for balance is innate. It's not something that, that, that we concocted out of our dreams that, that is a pipe dream. So we live in interesting times, and we can embrace that we live in interesting times. Now, that doesn't mean that the interesting part has to be against us, but we have to stand up to it, and we have to figure out how to stand up to it. It doesn't matter really that we have to get together and combat the thing. You've got to look at the situation. Some people are afraid and they're projecting that fear. Some people are paid to project fear. Some people are um, ordered or trained or, you know, guided to project fear. And so this fear really, from an esoteric, again, perspective, nothing is really wrong with the fear. It's what the fear tells you is going to happen. That is the lie, the projection, the map on the wall. The actual experience of fear is a response of emotion. And that emotion is there because it's been pushed away. It's regulated. You're only afraid when somebody's out to get you. So when you feel fear, you automatically associate it that somebody is out to get you. But what if fear is something else? What if it's your psyche's way of liberating you? from your enslavement to the buttons other people use to push all the time? What if that heightened emotion, the adrenaline, rage, fear, and this is kind of, I don't know if I could call it a radical thought. I've heard similar things, but, but think about it this way. Let's think outside of the box without going outside of ourselves. See, the box is a prison. And so thinking outside of the box is not thinking in a fancy way. It is throwing out the concept of complex thought versus simple thought. You just think in the way that matters to you. So say, fear, uh, fear is the enemy. Fear isn't real. Uh, it's a feeling that, that's really an illusion. No, you feel it. It's real. Emotion is real. It's an experience. You can measure it with your, you know, you, you take a blood sample and you see your, your blood chemistry is different when you experience an emotion as opposed to experiencing another emotion. It's real, and it's objectively real. What isn't real is all of this baggage on the emotion that tries to justify it, that tries to tell you why you're having the emotion, where that emotion is going to take you, and what the real outcome of the emotion is going to be in your life. So somebody goes, you know, they're not projecting fear. What they're saying is basically, World War III is coming. You're all going to die, you know, and then the fear comes up. And so... These two, should they be a so? Some people won't feel fear, though. Some people, like a psychopath, might be so disconnected that they'll say, oh, so World War III is coming. Somebody in, in an asylum for the mentally challenged might be taking certain pharmaceuticals that they tend to give the patients there that shut off their emotions completely. And so they won't have the experience, but they'll be able to see that they'll even laugh at the person that's talking about World War III. Because in a way, they're experiencing the information in an objective manner, that this is just a bunch of words. And they're telling you that, and you don't know if they're telling you the truth. But the fear, on the other hand, is real. You are conditioned to feel fear when you are in danger. However, there are different types of danger. One type of danger is when you are trapped in a box, 
when you're trapped in the matrix and you're crying to be free, you're crying to be you, you're trying to, crying to connect with meaning. And so the fear comes in wondering, will I ever be free? Sometimes you're enraged trying to get free, but if you feel impotent as you are trapped in this matrix, in this box, you feel fear. And so they are trying to ride that natural sense that my life is lived in quiet desperation when I'm not overtly afraid. So I am repressing something in me and I am allowing all of these other people around the world to suffer, you know, not in the objective manner because I can't really do anything about that objectively. I will just get myself killed. Let's put it that way. Uh, that's how most people think anyways. But my consciousness is not in solidarity with the people that are suffering. I'm not talking about misery loves company. I'm talking about an affirmation, an affirmation of the interconnected nature of our planet. Some people are afraid of empathy. They think it's going to stress them out, make them impotent, make them even more powerless. But the fact is, empathy is a muscle. Your empathic sense, anything that goes on in your nervous system is like a muscle. The more you engage in it with a certain mindset, of being in charge of your own feelings, of choosing to feel this empathy, it is not suffering. It is uncomfortable because, but it is a recognition of global discomfort, of, of the discomfort of the human condition. And so when you do these things, when you feel that way, when you affirm that, you own back your power, which is your emotions. Somebody's telling you the world is gonna blow up. I'm saying, it's not going to blow up because I choose to live in a framework where my emotions are my own. My fear is not because this person is telling me the world's going to blow up. My fear is there because I'm trapped in a goddamn matrix where people can push my buttons, where I'm trapped, where, where I have to run from danger that they impose on me. So how am I going to liberate myself from the danger? This is where you have to realize that the matrix is telling you the answers and these answers may not be real. Your five senses may not be enough to give you all of the information. So a sixth sense, your, your feeling sense, a seventh sense, your consciousness itself, which is even more abstract and difficult. But the point is that at least the sixth sense, we all have gut feelings. Our hearts respond. Our emotions respond. So they want our emotions fucked up. They want them messed up. They want them twisted. They want the ones to be pushing our buttons so we don't engage in realistic responsiveness. Where will that take us if we open up our hearts to the way the world is and ride that discomfort as much as we can? We don't have to be trapped by it. They're the ones who keep hitting us over the head with threats every time we seek to connect. You told me about your friend, Phil, who, you know, and the guy, as soon as you, you guys wanted to get together to have a, a, a whatever, a, a video that would have been meaningful, all of a sudden, you know, all hell breaks loose, bad luck, misfortune. I've had the same thing with other people wanting to connect, and whatever, misfortune. I've seen people and I've noticed that when somebody often, not, I can't make a rule out of it, but I've noticed that often when somebody is sincere and has a sincere desire to engage with others, uh, where two or three are gathered in my name, not in the religious sense, but in the sense of true spirit, the spirit of being, the spirit of becoming, the spirit of meaning, that's the true creator spirit, not a person with a beard or whatever, you know, like we do, but it's the spirit of it. When we engage, then something says no. Something is trying to push our buttons to create our reality. So I'm saying, Ron, and other people who doubt the fact that re reality creation can exist through awareness modulation or modification, well, how come other people get away with creating our reality? How come, and they don't just create it because they're, they're, they're in charge of the economies or they're in charge of the military. They create it by simple information. They tell us something is, and that's it. All of a sudden, all hell breaks loose. We believe it. We're fear. Our emotions respond. It's real to us. Whatever they tell us through this medium, through this box, the same box that I'm using to communicate to you and to everybody else, that they've, they, they've given, given us 
the ability to communicate with these boxes and it's it's our right but they're giving it in the sense of saying okay you, you can communicate too but they always interfere with the message they always interfere with the message they interfere with our emotions they interfere with events they manipulate reality in a thousand different ways and so they teach us the fact that reality can be manipulated and you don't have to do it just technologically. You can do it in other ways. The information thing isn't just technology, that's subterfuge, that's psychology. You know, that's, that's maybe you can call that technology. But I'm saying that if you look even deeper and know, use your intuition, your felt sense, your responses, disengage your emotions, not from yourself, don't disengage from your emotion. Disengage from the storyline that they're trying to shove up your ass and down your throat and associate. And your emotions have been taught to associate with that. Part of it is instinctive. Of course we're afraid in order to save our asses. But we are not in those conditions anymore. We, have, we are capable of making a choice. Evolution has taught us something that our emotions can be used on another level. Not just used, but because you don't use it like a slave, like a tool. It's part of you. It's who you are. It's your experience. In many ways, emotion is far more intimate than verbal thought, than what we're talking about, than the blah, blah, than the philosophical. And so somebody says, well, that's all over our heads. I don't think so. Emotions aren't over your heads. They're inside of you. You know, I'm just saying... When, when Look at the world. We live in interesting times, and I'm saying this is an opportunity, an opportunity to connect and not go brag about connecting, not go post all a bunch of videos of these people dying and these animals dying and this dying and that dying. Just, just engage in, in some kind of discussion to be open to the fact that I feel what's going on in the world, and I'm engaging to understand it, but I reject the storyline until I can go deeper. I'm an agnostic as far. I don't have to go around saying the matrix isn't real, it's an illusion. Uh, I am real, or this is real, or the world isn't real. No, I want to have the luxury, the, the comfort that I want to give myself through my recognition of true spirit, the spirit of meaning, to be able to, to say, I don't have to worry if it's real or not. I just let me be an agnostic. I don't know, and it doesn't matter. You know, I want to see where my experience takes me in this zone as I learn to choose what my reality is in terms of what's meaningful or not. Then I can maybe evolve a certain tool, a certain sense, a certain inner energy, if you will, or state that can help me disengage from the impositions. And then when two or more are gathered in my name, something useful might pop up. You're already gathering with other people in a religious context, and, and you know that's good. It's away from the internet. It's something else. You know the thing about the internet is everybody's listening. It's not just you know well-meaning people. There's a lot of people who aren't well-meaning, so they project something on. That's fine. You have nothing to hide in all of this, but it doesn't matter. Ill will until you can learn to handle it, until you can learn to absorb it and disengage from the storyline of ill will. Because the energy is something you may need. It's in the world. It's discomfort. The psychopath has feelings too, but they have learned to completely disengage from them and disidentify. They are in denial. Now, if somehow you can cultivate an energy, a state, a something, to, so the psychopaths have no choice but to recognize the feelings they're denying, then it's game over. They can't come up with anything because they are in the same karmic pot as everybody else. And that's what they're afraid of. And that's why they're in a rush. Evolution is moving. Evolution is the spirit, the divine spirit, the creator spirit within everything, moving it toward that state of perfection that it never really wants to reach. Because once it reaches it, then it's limited itself. It's a paradox. Once you're perfect, you're the most limited person ever because you stopped. Movement, Open-ended evolution is perfection. The process of moving open-ended toward infinity beyond, you know, that is true perfection because you can put every possibility into a single state of motion. 
Whereas if it's static, then it's a still picture. And you know, if I'm, if I'm like this, then I'm not like that. And so you cannot combine the two. Or even if you do combine them, then you're not like the other. Okay. So we are, what, 40 minutes? I think I've blabbed on enough. And my point is that we have the capability to truly think outside the box and to truly feel, because thinking outside of the box cannot happen in a vacuum. We need to feel outside the box. Then that becomes an experience. We need to dare to take our emotions, our feelings, our sixth sense in a different context than what we are told or our instincts have programmed us or whatever. You know. And that is a, a dynamic of discovery. So may we live truly in interesting times. Well, we do. <laughs> <laughs> You know, I didn't say much, I, but I was uh, listening to all that you were saying, and I will, of course, listen to this a few times, even before the rest of the people hear it. And so I thank you, as always, and uh, look okay. forward to our next conversation. And uh, do you have anything to, to just say at the close here? Or? Well, again, this was off the cuff, and there's tremendous, a lot of things happening in the world right now. And it's deliberate. It's not... They cannot afford to create more chaos than they can handle. They want us to die efficiently. That's <laughs> it. Let's get that through our heads. The whole thing about God, God is love, period. But true love, not just impersonal love or personal love or selfish love or unselfish love or this love or that love. You know, it's everything. And we cannot conceive of it because our dynamic is manifest, open-ended, and evolving. So other than the ability to perceive spirit, and God is more than spirit, or desire, God is more than desire, or form, God is more than form, you know, other than all of these things, it's best to just let the labels go and let it evolve because one thing is you get the revelation when you ask for it you step back and give it space to come into your life give it space to come into your life whatever you need you will learn i believe that you can create your reality but it is not what we've been led to believe this is something innate within us and we need to grow into it so i do not want to keep your time i believe keep the faith people keep the faith in yourself and you know, whatever happens, you are living here for a reason. And that reason is to establish your meaning in all of this. There is something to learn and something to become. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ariso, and namaste. Namaste, Ron.